Hi, this is Dr. A with Clinical Chemistry Review. We're going to look at GI and pancreatic function testing. So let's start with test of pancreatic function. Amylase and lipase are used to assess pancreatic function, uh, but sometimes it might be suspect as in um, it is possible, for example, to have chronic pancreatitis and have normal amylase and lipase levels. So normally amylase and lipase can be uh, elevated in like acute pancreatitis and stuff. Uh, you can also measure the other exocrine function of the pancreas with uh, secretin, CCK, um, let's just call it uh, cystokinin by the way, fecal fat, fat, trypsin, and chymotrypsin levels. So amylase and lipase are not the only tests of exocrine function of the pancreas. The bilirubin test can assess changes associated with extrahepatic obstruction. So again, that would be um, the blockage of the bowel duct because the bowel duct and the pancreatic duct come together, right? And um, so that if there's there are stones that are coming through and they're blocking, they could also cause uh, you know problems with the pancreas, but you would, it, it would be evident with the bilirubin test because there would be problems with bile flowing out of the liver and gallbladder and stuff. Gastrin, insulin, and glucose can be used to assess the endocrine-related disorders of the pancreas and pancreatic function and GI function in general. So. Um, the pancreatic, pancreatic insufficiency assessment for like patients that might have um, cystic fibrosis. Um, for the screening test, you can do CBC, ferritin, folate, B12, uh, looking for anemia, um, comprehensive metabolic panels, CMP. So you, what you're looking at is their um, it's, it's the consequences of not being able to properly absorb the food. So anemia is going to be one of them, uh, you know, low B12, low folate, um, low ferritin, CBC would reveal anemia. And then, you know, in the comprehensive metabolic panels, it might be low in certain electrolytes and other things like that. Uh, the specific tests that can be done for pancreatic insufficiency are the fecal fat and the pancreatic elastase 1. Uh, those are pretty easy, non-invasive tests. Um, then the secretin and cholecystokinin tests are a little bit more involved. The trypsin uh, antigen in stool and trypsinogen, that one's in the blood, and the comatrypsin on stool. A little bit on that secretin CCK test or cholecystokinin test. It's a direct determination of the exocrine secretory capacity of the pancreas. The test involves the intubation of the duodenum without contamination by gastric fluid, which then would neutralize any bicarb. Um, the test is performed after a six hour overnight fast. And uh, decreased pancreatic flow is associated with pancreatic obstruction and increase in enzyme concentrations low concentration of bicarbonate enzymes are associated with cystic fibrosis, chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic cysts, calcifications, and edema of the pancreas, and of course their diminished pancreatic function because of that. The fecal fat analysis, so the fecal lipids are derived from four sources. You have unabsorbed ingested lipids, lipids that um, were excreted into the intestines by the bowel, uh, and cells shed into the intestine and uh, metabolism of, of intestinal bacteria. Those are all sources of fecal lipids. The qualitative testing, you have, you can use Sudan 3, Sudan 4, oil red O, or non blue sulfate. Uh, the neutral fats and other lipids will stain yellow orange to red with the Sudan 3 because the dye is more soluble in lipids. So it's a dye that is attracted to lipid, not to water. Uh, increases in fat and undigested meat fibers will indicate steatorrhea of pancreatic origin. So you can see in this picture these bubbles of fat here to have stained would be then a positive qualitative test with using the Sudan 3 dye. A quantitative fecal fat determination usually requires a 72 hour stool collection. The sweat electrolyte determination, um, so this is the measurement of the sodium and chloride concentration in sweat. It's the most useful test for the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, although really this one's really been replaced by genetic testing. But um, if 
your lab still does, does those, does significantly elevated concentration of both ions would occur in more of 99% of affected patients. And of course, then they have cystic fibrosis. You would expect them to have um, a compromised pancreatic function and need pancreatic enzymes. Of course, you can do also the serum enzymes, amylase and the lipase. Amylase is the serum enzyme the most commonly relied upon for de detecting pancreatic disease. It is not, however, a function test, so it doesn't, it's just, you know, shows that it's present, not how it's working, basically. Um, amylase is particularly useful in the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, in which will be significantly increased, um, and that, that occurs at least in 75% of the patients. Amylase peaks at 12 hours and returns to normal in three to four days in cases of acute pancreatitis. Lipase is almost exclusively of pancreatic origin, uh, whereas amylase can be of salivary gland origin also. During acute pancreatitis, lipase levels will peak at 24 hours and they don't return to normal until 8 to 14 days later. So they stay peaked longer, again making it more specific and maybe better um, test for acute pancreatitis. Increased lipase activity is more specific than an amylase activity when you're looking for uh, acute pancreatitis. So some of the tests for gastric function. So you can measure gastric acid and basal maximal, uh, maximal secretory test. After an overnight fast, um, you perform as a, it's performed as a one hour basal test followed by a one hour stimulated test after pentagastrin administration. And the uh, stimulated secretion specimens, the ability of the stomach to secrete against a hydrogen ion gradient is determined by measuring the pH. The gastrin uh, response to secretin stimulation may be used to investigate patients with mildly elevated serum gastrin levels. In this test, pure porcine secretin is ingested and, I'm sorry, injected, not ingested, injected, and gastrin levels are collected at five minute intervals for the next 30 minutes. The plasma gastrin level can all be, also be done. It is invaluable in diagnosing the zillinger ellison syndrome, where gastrin levels can be as high as 10 times the reference range. So I would just, that's a serum, you know, plasma, sorry, plasma gastrin level. The lactose tolerance test. So disaccharidases like lactase and sucrase are produced by mucosal cells of the small intestine. Lactase is needed to break down lactose. Lactose is the sugar, lactase is the enzyme. And if you do not have this enzyme, then you cannot break down lactose. So um, acquired deficiencies of lactase are common in adults. Affected patients will have abdominal discomfort, cramps, and diarrhea after ingesting milk or milk products, especially things like ice cream. About 10% to 20% of whites and 75% of African Americans are affected. Lactose tolerance tests establish this diagnosis, but uh, is subject to many false positive and false negative results. Um, it has been replaced by largely by the hydrogen breath testing. That's the pretty much easiest way to determine that and their lactose intolerance of patients. The d xylose absorption test is a test of intestinal function. So d xylose is a pentose sugar that is ordinarily not present in the blood. Pentose sugars are absorbed unaltered in the proximal small intestines and do not require the intervention of pancreatic lytic enzymes, such as amylase. The ability to absorb d xylose um, helps differentiate between malabsorption of the intestinal etiology from that of the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, since we are removing the factor of the exocrine pancreatic need, right? So um, we don't require enzymes to absorb this because it doesn't need to be broken down. So therefore this d xylose, if it doesn't go from the intestines into the bloodstream, then you know that there's a malabsorption issue. So uh, the process of this test is after an overnight test, the patient boils and drinks a d xylose solution. Uh, the patient drinks the equivalent amount of water during the next hour. And then urine is collected for five hours after ingestion and blood specimen is collected at two hours. And again, the idea is if you're absorbing things correctly, that d xylose will show up in your blood 
and then later on into your urine. But if you are not absorbing anything in your intestines or you're having problems absorbing your intestines, the xylose will never cross into the blood and therefore won't be present into the urine. All right, so we also have serum carotenoids. So carotenoids are yellow to orange and purple pigments that are widely distributed in animal tissues and in fruits and vegetables. They are synthesized by many plants and give fruits and vegetables uh, their yellow color. So yellow, orange, red. So you can think of you know bell peppers uh, that are red and stuff, but also carrots, sweet potatoes, and stuff like that. The major carotenoids in human serum are lycopene, xanthophyll, and beta carotene. Beta carotene is the precursor to vitamin A to retinol, but your body has to be able to convert beta carotene to uh, the retinol. They are fat soluble, carotenoids are, and are absorbed in small intestines with lipids. So again, this is another good thing to put, for example, a little bit of olive oil, a little butter with your vegetables, and it allows you to absorb things like the carotenoids better. Uh, malabsorption of lipids can result in serum concentration of carotenoids that are lower than a reference range, reference range being 50 to 250 uh, milligrams per deciliter. For irritable bowel disorder testing, again, the IBD panel, <coughs> which has the ANCA assay, the maloperoxidase antibody test, the proteinase 3 antibody test, and the Saccharomyces cerevisiae cerevis IgG and IgA antibody test. Um, and patients with ulcerative colitis will often have, again, a positive PANCA uh, with perinuclear staining associated with MPO antibodies. And the Saccharomyces cerevisiae IgG and IgA antibody test can be positive in either conditions, so either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. The um, last bits of the test of intestinal function so it's almost kind of like a mis miscellaneous or others so um, being able to demonstrate that the patient has diminished appetite and diminished dietary intake that's one body wasting or cachexia so this is where they're just withering away if you will their uh, lean body mass is going down and everything uh, they're losing muscle mass etc this is showing a negative nitrogen balance uh, which be evident by decreased serum proteins and albumin. So uh, you can't even make enough proteins to function, much less build muscle. Deficiencies of the fat solu soluble vitamins, just as A, D, E, and K. Deficiencies of the vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. Uh, anemia, diminished iron and calcium absorption, all evidence of malabsorption. Decreased sodium and potassium levels and dehydration. Again, those can be uh, checked with the BMP or CMP. Uh, a decrease or a flat blood concentration curves in glucose, lactose, and sucrose tolerance tests. And then celiac serology tests can help diagnose celiac. The current protocol is both IgG and IgG antibody testing for tissue transcriptaminase antibodies and gliadin antibodies. That is it for testing. Thank you.